All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, move on to the next session. Uh, thanks for staying around the extra day. I know everyone stayed to see our talk, so we're excited to have you here. Um, this is our 2018 op opioid uh, update, um, and none of us have any conflicts of interest. Uh, this is what our objectives are. My name's Jason Hoppe from the University of Colorado. I'm going to go over some literature review and do a kind of high-level review and crush through some quick and but give you an idea of what's been out there. Um, and then we're going to hear about new synthetic opioids from Jillian. And then Scott's going to talk about opioid stewardship program, stuff that you can take back to your own shop. Uh, so I think uh, before I go over the uh, of the articles that uh, I wanted to talk about, it, it's important to, to level set and get some context here, right? Um, that the public still believes we need to fix this and that it's important that we consider what we're doing. Just last week, in case you didn't see, the president of McKeeson Pharmaceuticals uh, under oath directly blamed doctors for the opioid epidemic because um, uh, it's not the pharmaceutical companies, of course. Uh, so it's still out there. The good news is that we uh, have the opportunity to lead and that part of our job, right, is primary prevention, stopping people from starting opioids, uh, secondary, identifying people at risk. And then if you were at our talk, uh, that Scott and I did yesterday, uh, tertiary prevention, treating those um, who are already addicted. And so uh, this is my um, terrible kind of description of where I think where everybody is. And so it's important to know where you are on the spectrum of uh, opioids. And, you know, on the one end, probably 10 years ago, we were all that pain treatment was paramount and that opioids are the answer. Um, and I think a lot more of us are closer to the bottom of this spectrum now. Um, and I think you'll see where I am based on the articles I chose. But the reason it's important is um, this is an article from some of our peers that are here, but really looking at the theory of planned uh, behavior. Like how do we change physician decisions? So what goes into the fact that we can change how people act? And, and it's mainly three things, and um, I'm going to use those kind of as the context to talk about the, the articles here. But one is the attitude, right? You have to know uh, that what you're doing, or at least think what you're doing is right for your patients. So as the information comes in and supports one side or the other, um, that's going to change how the, the spectrum by, or sorry, the um, prism by which we, we uh, decide what our attitude is towards the intervention. Uh, perceived norms. So what, what are my partners doing? What is everybody else doing? Um, and that can be uh, influenced by the first one, right? If you're seeing in a national publication about your norms, uh, about what everybody else is doing, that can change your perception. However, you can also see what you're doing relative to your peers. Um, and then perceived control, right? So a lot of policies go into effect without any control for the providers. It's just dictated as to what we need to do. And so the first arc I want to talk about, um, I think, is an interesting one. This is a bibliometric analysis, which I didn't know what that was, but it's looking at the Porter and Jick paper. And for those of you who don't, uh, haven't done your history on this, this is a paper from 1980. The paper uh, is a stretch. It's a paragraph in New England Journal. Um, one paragraph description of the, the risk of uh, addiction in inpatients treated for acute pain. So these are not outpatients. This paper has been cited um, 600, over 600 times, and you can see kind of the course here. So in the beginning, uh, small number of citations, uh, and then it kind of peaked right when we started uh, having our opioid epidemic, 1996, and most of those were positive, and then now we're on the downslope where lots and lots of people are not, um, We've gotten away from it, and people are acknowledging that it was a mistake. But so this, just, just one paragraph, you know, in comparison, other paragraphs that were in this New England Journal were cited on a maximum of 11 times. So 609 times that this was, that this was purported to be evidence that what we were doing was safe and had this, you know, uh, unequal influence uh, on what we're doing. And so it's important to, to, to remember, I think, how we interpret these as to how they change actions. This is a recent one. This is in press. Um, I think I don't think it's been come out yet in the hardcover, but uh, this is uh, I like this one. This is a, a survey of prescribing basically by specialty. Um, and you can see here uh, what it looks like. So this is kind of the, the I think the best summary, which is really that office based had a lot more than inpatient, which had a lot more than emergency medicine. I would point out to the, uh, was it the y-axis, that that's growth in pr prescribing. 
of MMEs, and that's percentage, and the numbers there go up to 1,000%. So we're not talking about small amounts here, and I, I think that's important because the way that you interpret this or the way that this paper is sold can really influence what you feel about the way that you prescribe. And on the top is kind of, is uh, both of these are quotes from the paper, so, uh, or the attendant editorial, I can't remember which is which, but um, one is that, hey, relative to everybody else, we're doing a great job, it's not our fault. And uh, the takeaway point there, I think can be powerful as, as the way it influences what we think about, versus the bottom one, which is, um, wow, we've increased by 224%. And while that's less, we've increased by 224% how much opioids we're putting out there, and people are still dying, therefore we should be, consider uh, what we're doing. Um, and as far as the, the rest of in influencing our knowledge and how we make these decisions, um, another important uh, part of that is what happens after people leave the emergency department. And so this is looking at long-term opioid use, um, which is thought to be a marker for abuse. Uh, people that have chronic opioid use have higher rates of abuse and misuse. And so this is looking at, on the left, the number of days of first prescription, which is actually we're pretty good at. Uh, when you look at emergency department prescriptions, the average is pretty low, somewhere around 12 to 15, depending which study you look at. Um, but uh, the more you give, the more likely they're going to be on it at one to three years. And the average for this one was 6%, um, which is pretty consistent. This is not all emergency medicine patients, but these are all opioid naive patients getting their first prescription. Um, and then on the right, you see the number of prescriptions of that first episode. So they're opioid naive, and then they get a bunch in a row. This, I think, is uh, underestimated with us. I, we see a lot of people that come in with new pain um, that um, people People say they don't refill, but you know that we do see a lot of patients in acute pain that may get a second refill if you don't know about the first one, uh, sorry, second uh, prescription, or if you don't know about the first one. And you can really see that there is an opportunity to intervene here before people end up on long-term opioid use. This one uh, is also, I think, impress um, and uh, is uh, emergency medicine specific. Another look at. Um, insurer data, and here we see that um, one of the outcomes was that emergency department physicians prescribing are in concordance with CDC, although this is kind of a applying the CDC recs retrospectively because they weren't out when they uh, most of these prescriptions were written, um, and it makes sense. So we give smaller doses, uh, smaller duration, we don't give extended release, uh, which I think is great. Our long-term opioid uh, our risk for long-term opioid use of our patients here was purported to be lower, although you see that unknown source is, is a little high, um, and 10 to 15, I think it was 10% of the patients were, were unknown, so uh, potentially that's underestimating a little bit. I think the important thing here, though, that's kind of buried in this is that of the people that were opioid naive that were started on opioids, uh, you know, one-sixth of them came from us in the emergency department. So uh, while this is, the, you know, this is still formulating this argument that maybe we don't give as many, but we do expose a lot of people. Um, and we'd write a lot of, uh, we give, when you expose a lot of people, it's important to consider what happens to those pills. And this is surgical patients, but most of these were outpatient surgeries. And you can see as these people, opioid naive patients get their pills, most of them go unused. Um, most of them are not safely stored, and nobody gets rid of them. And so if we're giving, even if it's small amounts, when you apply that to the number of ED visits per year, we're, we're putting a lot of medications out there that are likely to be end up in someone's uh, you know, cabinet in their bathroom and used at some point by somebody how they were not intended to be used. Um, and so that was kind of, the, that's what I wanted to get at the first one, is how we, how we interpret uh, what's the, the current knowledge and that influences how we prescribe. Um, and I think the second part is really talking about how you prescribe relative to your peers and understanding that association. Um, and this just recently came out in academic EM, um, I think within the last couple months. Um, and I like this, this is kind of the third or fourth paper um, that we've seen looking at social norming. So social norming is the idea that you are doing something different than your peers, and once we correct uh, the, you're doing something um, different from your peers because you believe that's what everybody's doing. And then social norming is you correct that discrepancy and then you change your behavior. And so uh, there's been a couple, we, we did one of just uh, letting people know where they were relative to their peers. This was a, a, a randomized controlled trial where they gave you a distribution and asked you where you were on that distribution. Um, and then they would, the, this is the intervention, they would correct that um, and then see what happens over the next six to 12 months. Um, and in short, uh, most of the attendings were wrong. Most of the attendings uh, underestimated what their prescribing was. So I think that that's an important takeaway point. And then the people that underestimated had bigger change. 
And so there's, I think, a couple takeaway points from this. And so going left to right, that was time zero on the left, and then 12 months on the right. You can see the control group, they got nothing. Um, and so there's definitely, you know, every time we look at a study of opioids and everybody thinks that their intervention's the best, we need to make sure that we're looking at control groups because uh, everybody's decreasing their prescribing just because of uh, everything in the lay press. Um, so those that underestimated had, a different, had uh, more of a decrease. Right, so that's that bottom line. But I think what's interesting is the people that did not underestimate really didn't change their behavior as much and actually prescribe more. And so that, that's sort of the takeaway point for me that gets back to how we interpret the information and what we believe about ourselves. Um, and I think it's some, that they summarized it well here. If, if, if you perceive their, your prescribing to be appropriate and similar to your peers, you're less likely to internalize interventions and less likely to change the way that you prescribe. And so that's why I think the, the messaging that we need to be getting out there is important. And it's also important to know um, what you're doing relative to your peers. And I will tell you, this kind of stuff you guys can take back to your shop. Obviously, not the randomized controlled trial part of it. But administrative data can look at prescribing. And you can do prescribing rates pretty easily. And then um, depending on how you want to deliver it and, and where you are in the organization, you can show everybody where they are relative to their peers. And it, it's a powerful uh, influence. Um, Last is uh, control. So do you have control over what you do? A lot of people feel like they don't have control because they don't have any other uh, options to give people except for opioids. We spent you know, the last 20 years making bigger, stronger, better opioids and really haven't done anything else. Uh, but I, I think that there's a, a, a really important argument going on about the equipoise here in the management of pain. And this is an emergency medicine paper in JAMA, which we should always get excited about. And this is looking at pain in uh, acute extremity uh, trauma at two hours, uh, and it compared, uh, if you can read there, uh, NSAIDs versus NSAIDs plus oxy, NSAIDs plus hydrocodone, NSAIDs plus codeine, and there was no difference in the pain at two hours. Um, you know, RCT, I think, uh, well-designed trial. Still a little bit, you know, questions here. We don't know what happened when they went home. This is two hours. These doses are sort of on the lower end, so you worry about the generalizability, but really important, I think, that we start considering looking forward so that physicians don't feel that they have no other options, that the options that they do have are equivalent to the options that have the downside. Um, and then chronic pain. I'm sure nobody here sees chronic pain, but it's a knee, back, and hip pain. So this is the SPACE trial, if you're interested in looking it up. It's very interesting. This is amongst the VA population, um, and they got randomized to opioids versus no opioids. And the opioids, uh, sorry, the no opioids arm, they did get other stuff. So if they didn't, uh, didn't respond to NSAIDs, they got things like tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentin, things like that, lidocaine patches. So it wasn't just NSAIDs. Uh, but really, there was no difference in outcomes. They had a lot. There's a whole list of outcomes. I picked this one. This is functional outcomes. I think that's what we're most interested in, right? Pain as a proxy for how people feel is important and self-reported, but really, what is their functional outcome? Um, and out of all the outcomes they looked at, the only one that was advantageous that uh, opioids were advantageous with uh, was uh, anxiety, which is also kind of interesting because we hear a lot of stories about people self-treating with opioids for anxiety or depression and kind of as an entryway to having long-term substance use disorder issues. Um, so in short, uh, it's important to uh, have context when we think about what we read about and how we internalize it and how we discuss it with others. Um, take back the opportunity to look at standards of care of your institution and compare, and compare providers. Uh, it is, uh, it's not difficult to do if you have an electronic medical record. And then continue to look for other trials that show equipoise that, you know, what we're doing is that we have reasonable alternatives and we shouldn't feel forced and that we can message this to our patients as well. It's not that I'm doing nothing for you. It's that opioids have significant downsides and I don't want to do that to you. This is not that I'm under treating pain. This is that I want to be safe. And so I wanted to take one minute and just go through the last uh, kind of the future things to consider going forward. Um, this one's really cool. This is emergency medicine study looking at these tabs that have a radio frequency transmitter um, and you take them and then when they hit your stomach they activate and so they can tell you this is secondary compliance. So primary compliance, right, is do people ever fill their pills? For opioids, we know, at least in acute pain, that about one in five people don't actually even fill that prescription, which is sort of interesting. And then we know, as I showed you, that nobody takes all their pills. This is actually trying to, this can help you discover how many pills somebody actually needs. So they take the pill, hits their, hits their stomach, you know how many pills they took, what time they took it, um, and it sends it out to the cloud. 
Uh, this is the first ALTO study I've seen. I'm sure there are more to come. Uh, and this is looking at uh, some pathways for um, alternatives to opioids. Um, and there are some limitations, but uh, it's an important first study. And I, I would encourage anybody doing ALTO stuff to look at outcomes, because we want to make sure we're not trading one bad thing for another and make sure our patients are actually doing better. Um, and here they found less opioids, uh, statistically significant. I'm not sure it's clinically significant difference there. Um, and obviously they used more of other stuff um, because there was a pathway and then satisfaction was equivalent. So I would keep your eye out. I would say I know of at least one other one that's coming out, but there's going to be a bunch of these coming out over the next year. Um, this one I just brought up here, this is the study where they uh, FDA approval for sub-Q uh, buprenorphine. And so there's now two sub-Q uh, preparations and then this uh, implantable one. And this will be affecting us as potentially this is our opportunity to help uh, patients with high recidivism that don't have other access. You could st start this in the emergency department and get them follow up and buy them time. Although one of the sub-Q ones requires a buildup with buprenorphine first, which makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, but also how does it influence our pain management uh, approach? And then lastly, and, and super futuristic, is uh, here, this is a, a vaccine, anti-heroin vaccine. Now, there are two of these that I know of um, that are trying to get uh, approval for some human testing. Um, it, it's interesting, right? So they take the heroin and they, bind, they uh, put it to a protein so that uh, it, there's an antibody response. So if you use heroin, it gets sequestered in your blood, doesn't get across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the downside of that is could be how specific it is, right? So does it affect fentanyl? Are we just blocking one thing so, so uh, patients could potentially abuse something else? What is the impact on pain if, we, if the you know, heroin's similar in structure to morphine? And, you know, are we going to be able to un, unable to give people pain medications if they have an acute fracture? So these are things that are coming uh, I would keep your eye out for. Um, and that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. So I, I'm Jillian Beach. I'm one of the medical toxicologists at the Lehigh Valley Health Network. And uh, for the second piece of this talk today, I'm going to be giving an update on synthetic opioids. In the last several years, uh, U.S. law enforcement has seen a dramatic increase in the availability of synthetic opioids. And a large majority of these are, are structural derivatives of fentanyl, which we're all familiar with. Uh, that's a drug that has 50 to 100 times uh, more potency than morphine. And both transnational and domestic uh, criminal organizations are increasingly uh, utilizing these synth synthetic uh, opioids as adulterants in the street drug supply. So both in heroin and in illicitly manufactured uh, uh, prescription opioids, so counterfeit prescription opioids. And the potency of these products that are available uh, has led to a significant increase in both opioid overdoses and opioid overdose deaths. Many of us have seen this image before. So fentanyl uh, is uh, 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin. So whereas a potentially lethal dose for an opioid naive individual of heroin might be say 10 milligrams, the lethal dose of fentanyl might be one or two milligrams. And then carfentanil, which we've all heard of, is an, an opioid that was developed for veterinary use, often called an elephant tranquilizer in the media, is 10,000 times more potent than morphine and 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And so the concern is that with very low doses, uh, we can have an, over, uh, an inadvertent opioid overdose death. A br very brief little bit of history, fentanyl was first synthesized in 1959 and later marketed as sublimase. Fast forward to 1991, a brand of street heroin called Tango and Cash was 12% fentanyl and was linked to 126 overdose deaths in the United States, and those deaths were linked back to a clandestine lab in Wichita, Kansas. Fast forward again to the years between 2005 and 2007, and heroin adulterated again with fentanyl uh, and that was traced to a clandestine lab in Toluca, Mexico, resulted in over 1,000 overdose deaths in the United States and by 2015, we're now looking at uh, over 9,000 deaths secondary to fentanyl, and those numbers just keep going up. IMFs, or illicitly manufactured, uh, manufactured fentanyl or fentanyl analogs, are typically manufactured in a clandestine lab like you see in the image here. And uh, this was an interesting MMWR uh, that looked at just two months of data from Ohio, a particularly uh, hard-hit state. And uh, in looking at decedents uh, toxicology testing over that time, you'll see that the vast majority of them test 
positive for a fentanyl or fentanyl analog. But beyond that, even more concerning is that the vast majority of deaths tested positive for multiple types of opioids. So not only are you, do you think you're using your standard dose of heroin and you're actually getting a fentanyl or fentanyl analog, you're probably getting a mixture of multiple types of opioids. And so thus, using the standard dose of heroin that you've been using for a couple of years, uh, you, you really have no idea uh, what dose you're actually getting as uh, an opioid user. Looking at drug seizure data uh, from China and Mexico, we know that China, although producing a bit lower volume, tends to produce a very high potency fent fentanyl, while Mexico produces the vast majority of the volume that we see, although a little bit lower potency than that that comes from China. And uh, these imports come from China and Mexico into Canada, US, and Mexico, and then crosses borders from there. In addition, the dark web is used to distribute these synthetic opioids from China and Mexico and some other places globally. And so these drugs are commonly advertised on what we call crypto markets, which are commercial web-based marketplaces for transactions such as these, so for illicit uh, drugs like this. And, and these marketplaces provide anonymity to both buyers and sellers, and this is done via the dark web web, which you see at the bottom of the iceberg there, that's information that's not accessible by the typical internet browsers that we all use. And accessing the dark web content actually requires some specific software or authorization and typically is done through cryptocurrencies. So we've all heard of, of Bitcoin. And the sites are accessed using an anonymity network. So instead of having the traffic from your laptop, which moves through several layers of servers, what happens is the entire transaction stays on a hidden network and allows you as the buyer or seller to remain anonymous. And what we end up seeing is that these particularly potent opioids end up in uh, sub, uh, street drugs, including street Xanax, for example. So people really have no idea they're trying to buy an anxiolytic or to get a little bit of a benzo high and they're ending up with a synthetic opioid. And so we're seeing overdoses from street Xanax, street Norco, street Oxycontin, and many others. With high potency and low production costs, there's a very strong incentive to mix fentanyl into the supply of heroin and other street drugs, street benzos, street opioids, so those illicitly manufactured uh, uh, opioid pills. And so what happens is because these synthetic opioids are available for a very low cost, you can reduce the cost of some of these illicit opioids and in the meantime, dramatically increased risk. So as an example, a kilo of fentanyl purchased on the dark web might cost you something like $3,500 to $1,200 per kilo. And that's in comparison to a kilo of heroin, which might cost $60,000. So you buy that kilo uh, of heroin and you make a million counterfeit pills using a pill press in your basement or in your clandestine lab. And they typically sell those pills for a dollar a milligram, so an 80 milligram oxycontin might sell for up to $80. And you have millions of dollars of return, which is certainly a big incentive uh, to, uh, to use a fentanyl in these pills instead of uh, the, the true opioid. And there are a number of fentanyl analogs that are available on the domestic illicit market. Uh, as an example here, 4-fluoroisobutyryl fentanyl uh, is sold for about $6,000 a kilo, so about a tenth of the price of heroin. So why would anybody you know, buy and sell heroin when you could purchase something like this on the dark web and make a lot more money doing so? In addition to the fentanyl analogs, there are a number of other uh, opioids that interestingly were developed throughout the 70s uh, for research purposes and by pharmaceutical companies, uh, we are all on a quest to try to treat pain without the side effects of opioids. And so these were attempts to develop an opioid that might have fewer side effects. None of those worked very well, and so the patents went away, and these are available for purchase as research chemicals in many cases on the internet or on the dark web. And uh, so many individuals are purchasing these online. Uh, and are ingesting them, and they have no idea what the potency is like. For example, U or U4 or U47700 uh, has about seven or eight times the potency of morphine. Uh, MT45 and AH7921 uh, have about equivalent potency to morphine, but again, if it's packaged as a, a 10 milligram oxycodone, you, you still don't know what you're getting as a purchaser or user. This is a pill press that was seized by drug enforcement. So you can buy this pill press, put it in your basement, get a shipment uh, to your home, 
and press these pills. And if I'm in my basement making my uh, clandestine opioid pills, uh, I'm not going to probably have very good quality control, right? So there will be hot spots. So I might sell a bag of, of pills with a vast amount of a synthetic opioid in them and another bag that has very little in them. And so even the users who are buying from the same distributor or dealer have no idea what they're getting at any given particular dose. So what do we do? So thinking about just the basics, right, in emergency medicine or in the field, in, in EMS, um, the most important thing is to, is to bag these patients. So we, ought, we're, you know, we obviously need to get naloxone out there and distribute it to patients, but bagging the patient is the most important thing. I don't care that their pupils are tiny or that they're not talking to me. I just care that I provide them respiratory support. And many toxicologists now recommend that you bag the patient for several minutes before even administering naloxone. And uh, certainly where available, uh, naloxone uh, is important to use as well. So this may not uh, you know, be um, immediately accessible on every scene, just like a bag valve mask may not be available on every scene. So you use what you can. But many toxicologists now recommend a very low dose of naloxone. So uh, most people who are using a synthetic opioid are accidentally overdosing. So they might overshoot by a little bit. And many of us now are working very hard to try to keep the patients in the ED, to link them to treatment, to potentially even start buprenorphine. And uh, rapidly reversing them with massive doses of naloxone really doesn't help with that. The patient goes into severe withdrawal and immediately essentially has to leave. It's an incredibly uncomfortable experience for them. If you use 0.04 or a tenth of the typical starting dose we've been using, what you can do is knock just enough of the opioid off the mu receptor so the patient now breathes maybe eight times a minute. They'll still have tiny pupils. They'll still be a little somnolent, but they look fine on the monitor, and you can allow them to slowly come down from the rest of that uh, opioid toxicity so that you can try to provide them linkage to treatment and potentially uh, start MAT. Now, in many cases, uh, it, it's possible that there may be a lot of opioid around, maybe a suicidal ingestion or a body stuffer or perhaps someone who took a whole dose of carfentanil instead of their, the heroin they expected. And in those cases, there may be a need for higher doses of naloxone. So we recommend starting at 0 0.04 and escalating doses every three to five minutes. It takes three to five minutes for naloxone to work. So bag them for three to five minutes and then redose. The reports we're seeing of patients getting four or five doses of naloxone before they arrive to the ED is probably happening uh, either because they're not being bagged, because it's just a, you know, a law enforcement officer or someone, a, a bystander, or because the doses are being given in rapid succession. You give a dose, a minute feels like a lifetime in the field. You know, if you have a patient in a library bathroom, and so you dose them again, and another minute later, and then they wake up three to five minutes later, and the report to us in the ED is that they got five doses of naloxone, when the first dose probably would have done the trick if they had been bagged for that five minute time period. We're also seeing a lot of this. So given the prevalence of these synthetic opioids, our law enforcement and, and EMS uh, colleagues have become increasingly concerned about potential exposures while they're responding to medical calls or crime scenes or drug raids. And we are getting reports of, of emergency responders who are becoming symptomatic. My body shut down, I'm dizzy, I feel like I'm dying or, or having a syncopal episode. And interestingly, when we review these cases, we note that they're very actually inconsistent with opioid toxicity. There's no meiosis, no respiratory depression, and no CNS depression. So many of these cases may actually not be due to an opioid. It's a very stressful situation to work in. And some of these may be due to stress or overheating or some of the other issues that first responders deal with. And so what we need to do is think about balancing safety uh, with mobility and efficiency and the ability to administer safe care in the field. And so we probably don't need this kind of PPE, unlike what we're seeing in our newspapers. This is a DEA agent who is touching synthetic uh, opioids, uh, a fentanyl analog. She's using eye protection, a mask, and gloves. And for the most part, based on new American College of Medical Toxicology and American Academy of Clinical Toxicology guidelines, you probably just need what she's wearing for your standard pre-hospital management or ED management of an overdose or potentially a mildly contaminated patient or scene, maybe a little bit of powder on their clothing. A mask is fine, N95 or P100 is probably the most effective if you want to be really cautious. For dermal protection, nitrile gloves uh, and eye protection to protect uh, the eye mucosa. We recommend hand washing, not using the alcohol gels because that essentially creates a little mini sort of uh, 
fentanyl patch on your hand, right, like a little transdermal delivery system. For a, a very contaminated scene, obviously you would want to protect your skin, so a standard EMS uniform or scrubs uh, or a gown if you want to have arm protection. And really it's just about knowing the signs of opioid intoxication. So you have EMS on standby on a scene or uh, uh, our clinicians in the ED providing naloxone and bag valve ma uh, mask ventilation should a patient become uh, symptomatic or a responder become symptomatic. Now that being said, I do advise uh, county hazmat in my area, and what I've told them is that I'm not going to send our hazmat guys in with, with glasses and a mask and nitrile gloves. So these individuals are assessing scenes where the toxin is unknown. So you breach this scene here, you don't know if it's uh, a nerve agent or an, an opioid or chlorine gas. I would encourage the, those individuals to use their standard hazmat protocols. And what you see here lying on the ground is an individual with level B PPE, so that's the breach level recommended. Behind that individual in the bright yellow or green are two individuals in level A PPE, so the maximum level of PPE. Those individuals are going to go into the scene and assess and do the initial assessment of what we're dealing with here. And then in the background of the picture you see some level C PPE, just chemical resistant coveralls, boots, and an air purifying respirator and they'll, they'll be on standby to assist. And once we know what's going on, you know, on this hazmat scene, we could then send an EMS clinician in or uh, law enforcement in with their glasses, their mask, and their gloves. And it's exactly what we'd wear if we thought we might be touching blood or exposed to blood spatter on a, tr a typical trauma scene. And so those same protections of, of our mucosa are what we would recommend. And so as we all go back to our various shops and, and help our EMS agencies, our HAZMAT, our ED teams figure out what we need to do, I think what we need to do is, is balance how to best provide care for our patients. And for the, the most part, none of us need any PPE like this at all. If we each put four fentanyl patches on each palm and we waited 15 minutes, we would each get a dose of about 100 mics, which is a, a dose perhaps you'd feel a little bit of opioid effect, but not much. And so if I'm touching a surface as a law enforcement officer without gloves on for full 15 minutes, it is unlikely without that really nice transdermal delivery system that comes with a fentanyl patch that I'm going to become symptomatic at all. And it's, it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to develop uh, symptoms through aerosolization. So unless there's detonation or, uh, you know, uh, weaponization, which has happened, uh, we probably as you know, medical personnel don't need all of this uh, PPE, and if we wash our hands and use standard basic PPE, we should be absolutely fine. And with that, I will turn the mic over to Scott. Great, thank you. Uh, Scott Weiner from Brigham Women's Hospital, thank you so much for staying. Um, I guess you got a cheaper flight right now. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to talk about another concept, which is creation of an opioid stewardship program in, in your ED. And it's basically language that we've poached from the ID literature where they have antibiotic stewardship. And we mean that in the, the purest sense of the word, which is the conducting, supervising, or manage, managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. And I think that's a nice definition for what we have to use, use with opioids, which they are, can be beneficial, but they can also be quite harmful, and we have to be responsible stewards. As Jason alluded to, we're not major prescribers of opioids if you look amongst the other specialties. Uh, this was a study we had done in, in Ohio, and you can see that EM is only responsible for about 5% of all opioid prescriptions. And then if you break that down further into pill counts, it's 1.6%. And if you break that down further into morphine milligram equivalents, it's 1.2%. So we often have used this argument to go to policymakers and say, you know, look, it's not us. We're not the ones that are responsible. But the reality is that we do share a responsibility in this, which is why the, the stewardship is important. Another thing that we found, too, is that those are just prescriptions overall. But we also know that amongst our specialty, there's quite a bit of variation. And this is a study that uh, we all, I think we all worked on this, right? On the POSE study? Are you involved? Yeah. Okay, Jason and I worked on this. Um, and we saw that the, the mean number of pills that were given out at a prescription was 17. This was back in 2012. But you can see those dots over on the top of this graph, which there were a lot of outliers that we found as well. And we've noticed that in, in pretty much every, every time we've looked at this prescribing, that some of our colleagues will just prescribe more than others, and they, they are outliers. So just in other words, I think that we don't write a large number of prescriptions compared to other specialties, but we have large variation, 
And sometimes we are the ones that start the fire. And just as a little more proof for this, I, uh, there's a really nice paper that, that Jillian was involved with that talked to patients that were reporting heroin or non-medical opioid use. And about 60% of them said that their first exposure was a legitimate prescription. And of that, 29% of them got their prescription from the ED the first time. And that was striking to me because even though it's, it beats a percentage of a percentage, it still is a certain number of patients that I'm seeing that I'm writing an opioid for will go on to long-term non-medical use or heroin use. And this, this is a very important message that we need to share with our colleagues. Another cool study that Jason actually did looked at patients with, with minor painful conditions that got opioid prescriptions. And of the patients that were opioid naive, about 12% of them were still on them at, it was, it was a year, right, for recurrent use. So just, and I've seen this number over and over again, somewhere between 10 to 15% of people that we start that are quote unquote opioid naive, they haven't been on it for at least a long period of time, uh, will be on them chronically when we start that prescription. And so, you know, you can make the argument that this, this might have been because they had a fracture or something that was, that was medically very severe, but in Jason's study, it was really minor painful conditions that should have been self-limited. And then finally, the other paper that uh, came out not too long ago was Michael Barnett's, which you probably saw from the New England Journal. It was interesting that the way that they analyzed it is that if you happen to be a higher prescriber in your group, in your individual department, your patients were more likely to be on long-term use. And it just goes to the point that we need to be careful with these medications. So what I want to propose to you is the idea of an opioid stewardship program that any of you can bring back to your departments. And I think that there's four key interventions. The first would be guidelines. The second would be benchmarking. The third is the alternatives to opioid program. And the fourth is implementation of harm reduction. And I'm going to go f um, as far as to say that I think that there needs to be a director for this. And if you're going back to your chair, or you are a chair, designate someone who will be the director of this, this program. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. It's not just something that you know, a medical director is just going to add on for another 20 minutes of, of, of their week. It takes a lot of work to do this. And we're in such a crisis period with this epidemic right now that we really do owe this to our patients. So um, go back to your departments and say, Scott from SAM said that you should have a director. Um, so the first part of this is, uh, is opioid guidelines. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton of guidelines out there. They're all, all fairly similar, but they do work. Um, and this was a study that we had done also in Ohio where uh, we looked at the opioid prescriptions before and after they released a statewide opioid prescribing guideline. And the cool thing about it is you can see that at the beginning there's a lot of, there's a lot of variation, in, a seasonal variation in opioid prescribing. And we see this routinely. It's, pr it's pretty interesting. We always see like February goes very low, summer goes very high. It's, it's just, it's interesting. But this line is where, the, where the, um, the opioid prescribing guidelines were released in Ohio. And you can see that there was a secular trend. The prescribing was going down already. But we saw that when we introduced the guideline, it went down further than we expected. And we even compared it to orthopedic surgery in the same state. And we found that they had the same secular trend, but they didn't get the additional bonus of decreased prescriptions that, that emergency medicine did with that, that, those guidelines. Now, again, there, there are a lot of guidelines out there, uh, but I do want to talk about these best practices that we just came up with for the, the EQUAL network. Um, so Kate Hawk, who's in the back there, and, and myself were the, the uh, I guess, the co-eyes on the, the opioid part of this, this, uh, this initiative. And what it is, it's pretty cool. So it's, um, it's sponsored by ASEP. They initially worked with CMS to reduce uh, high, uh, unnecessary imaging, uh, improve sepsis care, improve care for patients with chest pain. And it's gotten, it's gotten very well, particularly in the non-academic hospitals, more like the smaller community hospitals where there might not be a lot of people that are coming to this meeting and being up on the top, top literature. Um, so they've been able to use this to get the word out. And the reason that it works is that they use the CMS MIPS program, which actually gives a little bit of an incentive back to the department for participating. We're very fortunate that we added, recently added a fourth arm, which was on opioids. Uh, this was fun, uh, funded by the Addiction Policy Forum, which is a large nonprofit. And we've convened an expert panel that, that Jason sits on also. Um, and we've created a bunch of best practices that hospitals can, uh, can adopt. And so there are, there are eight of them. And I'll go through them really briefly. I'm sorry for all the text. Um, but the first is that non-opioid pain relievers should be recommended and or prescribed prior to and concurrent with opioids as appropriate. Bottom line, use non-opioids first. And if you're going to use opioids, then make sure you're also using the non-opioids in addition, because you want to wean off of the opioid as soon as you can. 
Opiate prescriptions shouldn't be written for chronic pain unless there's coordination with the patient's primary pain treating clinician. And this is actually protection for all of us. You know, if a patient comes in, you can say, I'm sorry, I, this, is, this is my guideline. I need to follow this. This is, this is what, you know, quote unquote, they are telling me to do. Can really, can, can protect you so patients don't feel like they're being treated differently, um, that you treat everybody the same way and that chronic pain is not treated in the ED. We treat acute pain. We're happy to talk to your primary pain treating clinician, but the guidelines state that you should get your, your opioids from one provider in that case. Lost, destroyed, or stolen opiate prescriptions shouldn't be refilled. Uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, and then that the state PDMP uh, should be checked prior to prescribing an opioid. We're all in states now that have PDMPs pretty much. I think we're up to 49 now. Um, I think Missouri, did they finally have those activated? Anybody from Missouri here? Just in St. Louis, okay. Um, but this is a best practice. Um, you know, Massachusetts for the past couple of years, we've had a mandate that we have to check it before every prescription. And we've, we've fought it tooth and nail. It's not that bad. It's really, it's, you get used to it, it's really easy. And we actually just activated a one-click uh, integration with our EMR just this past week. And the reason we could do that was because we, we said to the state, you're making us do this, let's make it as easy as possible. So it actually can help us. The other four for this are that opioid prescriptions should be limited to the shortest duration possible. And typically three days are, are enough. For that digital pill study that, that Jason alluded to, they looked at people that had fractures that were discharged from the ED. And they used a median of eight pills. These are for patients with fractures. So the, that was, you know, the pill count of 15 was even too much, which is pretty interesting. We should be educating our patients on, on realistic uh, risks and benefits about opioids. There should be expectation management. Uh, we should be careful with high risk groups. We should educate patients and potentially avoid uh, co-prescribing opioids with benzos, which we know is a very dangerous combination. And then similar to the chronic pain issue, we really shouldn't be prescribing long acting or extended release opioids from the ED. Um, now, so the second, and uh, the bottom line for showing you this is that we hope you'll adopt these for your ED. You can, uh, of course, modify them as, as you need, but this, this really represents what we think our best practices in 2018. The second uh, part to all this is alternatives to opioids. You've probably heard about this program. It was really spearheaded by Alexis LaPietra and, and Mark uh, Rosenberg out in St. Joe's in, in New Jersey. Um, but it, it, it encount encompasses using non-opioids, trigger point injections, ultrasound guided blocks, uh, nitrous oxide for some indications. But I will say that it's, they, they show these marked decreases in their use of opioids, but it's similar to also what Jason alluded to before that we didn't do a formal program in our, our department and we've also seen similar drops in our prescribing. But because of the existence of these programs and just the, the, the idea that we go to non-opioids first, that's, that's permeated throughout our department and that's has helped us reduce our opioid prescribing without reducing patient satisfaction and without reducing their, their appropriate pain treatment. So you don't necessarily have to have a specific program for this, but in, encompassing some of the principles would be helpful for your practice. So these are some examples they use. Renal colic, of course, most of us are using Ketorolac or Toradol now. Um, people are using IV lidocaine with good success as well. Musculoskeletal, use the Tylenol, the Motrin, the muscle relaxant if, if absolutely needed. Uh, the lidocaine patches help quite a bit. Headaches, um, of course, the guidelines state that we shouldn't be using opioids at all for headaches. And it's lucky we have a lot of things in our armamentarium, our Reglan, ibuprofen, sometimes Depakote or Dex for really refractory headaches. That headaches. And then extremity fracture, people are using intranasal ketamine, again, uh, ultrasound glided regional anesthesia, uh, and uh, nitrous oxide, for example. So the third arm of all this is the benchmarking. And um, we've spoken a little bit be before this in, the, uh, in Jason's talk also, but this was actually a, a cool study that Jason did that I thought was really innovative. They first did a retrospective look of their prescribing in the departments, and they found that about 20% uh, of discharged patients were getting a prescription. And so they shared that information with their, their prescribers and they said, okay, now we're gonna start looking at your prescribing. And just by doing that, the prescri prescribing went down to about 13%. And then they said, now we're gonna compare you to your peers. And without actually comparing to peers, it dropped to about 8%. Did I get that right? Yeah, the, the first, uh, almost right. The first step we actually, gave, the second step we gave them the data, uh -huh. but for the third one we said we were gonna de-identify the data. You identify the data, okay. Um, but just, it's this social norming idea too that you actually share that information with your peers or that they know you're gonna be shared, the Hawthorne effect, and it actually does, does affect behavior. Uh, 
And of course, this is the paper from uh, Sean Michael from UMass that Jason just shared. In my own department, this is what it looks like. So um, that, that study from 2012 I mentioned before, we found that 17% of discharged patients were getting opiate prescriptions. And this is from 19 hospitals around the country. And so recently we started another study where we're doing this, this benchmarking reports. And when we, we looked at calendar, or roughly calendar year 2017, and we found that on average, we were prescribing to about 5% of patients. So this is markedly decreased from the 2012 17%. We're down to 5%. And so what we did was we de-identified it, and we showed people how they were compared to their peers, and they were all given a, a random three-digit number. And you can see that we have, we have a pretty wide spread. Um, there was like 8.5% in some cases, all the way down to 3.5%. And we, we looked at pill counts. The mean was about 11, but we found some variation. There was like 14 down to kind of around eight or so. The interesting thing is that we show this data quarterly, and the first quarter we showed it, we went from 5% to 4%. And the second quarter we, we pre presented it, which just finished in the end of April, we went down to 2.7%. So I thought we were already ridiculously low. Just by sharing this data, we've gone down almost by half. And again, we haven't seen an uptick in complaints about pain management. We haven't seen patients stating that you don't, we're not treating them appropriately. We're, uh, often patients know about these medications now from the lay, lay press, and they just don't want them. Um, and we're using alternatives, and it's working. And if you really want to talk about social norming, this is what we're doing in our system now. So each one of these bars represents a hospital in our system. And it's, it's pretty amazing when you go to the leaders group and you say, well, your hospital's at 8.4%, and this hospital's at 2.6%. What's going on there? Um, and you see how quickly that the, the chairs of the department start to act and, and get involved and engage in this process. Now, the final part for all this is really about harm reduction. Um, and so this is the, the, the last part of this, the equal uh, guidelines that we're recommending, and there are, there are five principles. The first is that after an opioid overdose, we should consider communication with the patient's PCP when possible. Um, this was mainly because there was a, a big study that came out maybe a year or two ago now that showed that uh, the vast number of patients that had opioid overdoses went on to get subsequent prescriptions from their primary care doctors or their primary pain treating doctors. So there was obviously this lack of communication between the, what happened in the ED and then going back to the PCP. We should prescribe naloxone or at least provide it to patients at risk for overdose along with uh, overdose prevention education. Just out of curiosity, how many of you distribute, dispense naloxone in your ED to patients? How many of you routinely prescribe it? Yeah, okay, it's good to know. Um, we should be referring patients to treatment with a warm hand handoff when possible. Uh, we should consider buprenorphine when possible. And then after overdose, um, excuse me, we should access for a suicidal ideation if that was indeed the reason for the overdose, which does happen sometimes. And also, we should ask permission to contact a friend or relative. You'd be surprised, sometimes, sometimes patients obviously don't want their, their loved ones to know. Um, sometimes they do. Sometimes they want someone that can help look after them in this acute time of need. And so often you might be able to reach a friend or family member that is, is kind of willing to, to take over when the patient's discharged from the ED and they can make sure that they're in a safe place. Back to that naloxone piece, for those of you that aren't doing it, um, Jason and many others worked on a really nice white paper about how to set up a, a distribution program from your, your department. And just the last thought I'm going to leave you with is that, um, really as bonus points, is that if you do this in your ED, you may as well do this in your hospital. And what I mean by that is that we as emergency physicians are perfectly poised to, to run opioid stewardship in the hospital. We're the ones that interact with all the specialties. We understand the nuances of what patients with chronic pain need, with trauma, with acute surgery, uh, with minor injuries. Everything that we see really overlaps with, with the, whole, the whole hospital. And so in my hospital, I've, I've uh, enjoyed running the, the stewardship program there. Uh, I know Jillian runs her program as well, too. Uh, Jean Marie Perrone in, in Pennsylvania has, a, has had similar success with the whole, um, the whole system. And it's an opportunity for us to lead. So I, I give you that challenge. So with that, um, I think we'll, we have we're about 10 minutes left. And we're happy to take questions or discussion about all of this. Thank you. Questions? Uh, that was great. Uh, Kit Delgado from um, Penn. Um, 
One thing Jean Marie and I uh, did at Penn uh, was to sort of reinforce the guidelines. We implemented a default of 10 tablets in our EDs and basically overnight uh, the, the proportion of prescriptions uh, for 10 tablets uh, went up to like half, half of our prescriptions. Um, and so just a, a way of, um, of making guideline concordant prescribing really easy with like very little intervention. Um, and then uh, on your last point, uh, we, we approached other groups within the hospitals like orthopedics and stuff like that to do that. And, um, and uh, basically they didn't want to do that because they were worried about their patients having a lot of um, pain symptoms and going other places. And so we called their patients after their surgeries and found out they only took you know, three or four pills. And then we implemented defaults and we're moving the needle much more in these post-op prescribing. So I think there's a lot, of, like you said, there's a, a role that we can play as emergency physicians within our health systems. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's great. There's a group from North, uh, no, Michigan. I think it's Chad, I think his name's Brumlett or Bartlett. He's an anesthesiologist. And they basically go through all of the, they've worked with a bunch of different types of surgery. So they have the number of pills used for hand surgery and they publish most of them. Um, and so we've kind of used those as guidelines to bring back. You did a lot of legwork yourself, which is I'm sure appreciated, but some of that for everybody else doesn't have those kind of access or resources, that stuff is out there. Uh, and I would say that um, neither Scott nor I mentioned it, but I, I think it's reasonable to think about when we do interventions like pill counts to start to make sure that we do keep an eye on patient outcomes. I'm not sure patient satisfaction is a reasonable way to um, judge what we're doing. So bounce backs, looking at pharmacy data to see did they fill a prescription two, three days later after they left the ED? If we don't give them a prescription, you know, is there other uh, pain issues beyond so that when we get to 2.5 percent or whatever prescriptions that we uh, are not exposing ourselves to the argument that we're under treating pain. And so um, uh, I think uh, those are both uh, perfectly good interventions. We just need to make sure that we are responsible in the way that we respond, I think. Yeah, no, it was, it was great work on the, the pill count. Um, and I, it can be taken to such a, a higher level as well, too. So, you know, a lot of us are using Epic or Cerner and things like that, and it's really taken us about two years to get some good clinical decision support in place, but I, I feel like we're to a place where we actually do have it. So, um, be, because we're working with the whole system, we now have a registry of, of patients that are on, on med pain medications chronically that the primary care physicians use. We have a whole special note type that people use so you can quickly identify who their primary opioid prescriber is. We have a, a clinical decision support that says like, oh, you're on opioids and benzos together, make sure you don't want to do this. Uh, oh, your first prescription is, is for more than seven days, you don't want to do this. So you can, you can imagine and start building in all these really cool things which actually let the, the, the health records do what they're supposed to do for us, which they haven't done all along. Um, so there's, there's, there's tons of opportunity for, for that, which is, which is fantastic. So, so uh, at, at our institution, uh, we've been working with our surgeons. And uh, one thing I noticed is that using actually those, that Michigan data uh, is that we have a lot of good information about numbers of pills that we should be doing or numbers of days. Um, and, and some of that Michigan data, for example, will say, you know, for, for laparoscopic surgeries, consider 14, the equivalent of 14 oxycodone pills. And then it goes up into the mid 20s for a big open, like an open colectomy or something like that. And one thing that bothered me about that is that I still think a big piece of this is patients understanding what, what they should expect in the post-op setting or when they're being discharged from the, from the ED. Uh, and that, for example, a fracture going home from the ED, that's potentially one, uh, you know, a, a cause of pain that many of us would still consider using opioids, even those of us who are trying to use opioids as infrequently as possible. And what the, what the patient should expect, the swelling should go down over the next few days as you elevate the legs and schedule your NSAIDs um, and use some ice over the, you know, the splint, um, that your pain should go down and you should be weaning these over the course of three days. Most patients use no more than three days worth so that they understand that. And so what we did at our institution, instead of just doing default numbers of pills, we created opioid weans. And so 
at discharge, the surgeon, uh, you know, it says for a, a laparoscopic procedure, select the three-day wean. It is 14 pills, so it fits that number, but it specifically guides the patient day by day over the three-day course, plus four days of ongoing scheduled NSAIDs, how to get themselves off the opioid. And so the surgeon can say at discharge, or the nurse who's reading them there, AVS can say, this is what we expect. This is the most, uh, you know, that you should need. Hopefully you'll need fewer than these three days. And then for the big open surgeries, a seven-day wean that's, all, you know, very similar and goes on for a total of 10 days of seven days of weaning opioids and then uh, three additional days of scheduled NSAIDs. And my hope is that rather than the patient, you know, the patient gets their bottle of pills and in case they take them obediently, and run out of them and then come and see us in the ED, that they actually have a plan and that we can then look in, in we use Epic, can look in Epic and say, oh, the, selection, the, the surgeon selected a three-day wean and explain to the patient again, you ran out of your pills in, in a day and a half, this is what we expect. Uh, and you know this is how to how to manage the next few days. And that might we're gonna we're doing data analytics as part of our opioid stewardship program. And I'm hoping that we'll figure out that that it's we see a little bit less recidivism in terms of patient, you know, consuming all of the pills obediently in the post-op setting and then coming to see us for more uh, if they have a better understanding of of what the expected duration of pain or treatment is going to be. Brilliant. I love the, the wean wording as opposed to a course or something like that. We should probably all be using that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're at the at time. Thank you all and um, good luck. <laughs>